Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for making the time to join us today. I hope you're all having a great time at Cloud Next 18. Are you enjoying yourselves? <laughs> Woo. They told me this would be the most lively room in the afternoon sessions. They weren't wrong. <laughs> all right, let's get to it. I'm Ganesh Chilakapati, product manager with Google Cloud, and I'm really excited to introduce all of you to data regions for G Suite. Now, before we dive into data regions, I think it's really important for us to spend a few minutes closely understanding how G Suite is built and how it's architected. The reason is a solid understanding of this will really help you fully comprehend everything that we're doing with data regions for G Suite. So by a show of hands, how many of you here know what G Suite is all about? It's quite a few hands. So, for those of you that don't know what G Suite is, it's our collection of apps that help our enterprise customers bring people and information together in a very meaningful way to drive productivity. Now, like you heard at Prabhakar's keynote yesterday, we're really focused on doing this with three key themes. We want to make G Suite secure, smart, and simple. Let's spend a minute on what each of these themes mean. Right? Let's start with secure. Security is not an afterthought or a bolt-on for any of us here at G Suite. It is deeply embedded and enmeshed into the way we build G Suite. And like you heard yesterday, we focus on it being full stack. And that full stack security, along with key tools like security keys, which is extensively used at Google, means that we have almost zero reported account hijackings. And like Prabhakar said it, that is security nirvana. And that's the kind of nirvana that we want to deliver to our customers. The second theme was that of smart. Now, this is where we bring to bear our deep research in machine learning and intelligence. We do this in a very meaningful way as an assistant to help you scale yourself when you're using G Suite. A great example was the Smart Compose feature that all of you saw yesterday, which helps you complete sentences in your emails and your documents, thereby saving you a few seconds every single time you type, which I bet is pretty often. And the third theme is simple. It's really important to remember that we're doing all of this in a way in which we abstract away the complexity from all of you, our customers, and make it simple and easy to use. A great example of simplicity is what you see up here. Five different people at five different locations in the world, all on the same document, on the latest and greatest version. None of these people have to waste their time with version anxiety, version roulettes, latest versions, et cetera. We abstract away all the complexity of reconciling all these edits and showing them to you, irrespective of wherever they are in the world today. Now, how do we do this? We do this through, and I think Diane put this really aptly yesterday, we do this through our two decades of investment that we've made in our network and infrastructure. We bring that to bear to help teams collaborate seamlessly, irrespective of wherever they are in the world. And at this point, it's really important to remember that G Suite does not have a tenant-based architecture. You will never have to spend any time with G Suite on performance tuning, never. We treat all of our cloud as one instance. And we're truly planet scale. I know some of you are saying, wow, planet scale? That's a tall claim, right? So I want to walk you through a few stats. And I want to do this in the form of a trivia game, just to make this a little more interactive. So to kick things off, does anyone in the audience want to take a guess in terms of percentages? How much of the world's internet traffic do we support on the Google Cloud network? Did you say 25? Amazing. I really wish I could give you some swag. They said all I could do was give you bragging rights. So. <laughs> 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 
That's right. Greater than 25% of the world's internet traffic is on our network. Think about what that means. For every four bits traversing the internet in general, there's one bit going through our network. Can you imagine how much cable that would take? Does anybody want to take a guess how many miles of cables we've laid out around the world? Wow, participation rates really dropped once I said no swag. <laughs> <laughs> Greater than 100,000 miles. It's more than what I could fit into the background of this slide. And this isn't just about you know, ferrying bits around the world. This is about being able to do this at scale. Our network can support 500,000 YouTube videos playing at the exact same time. And oh, in high definition. Just think about that scale for a moment and think about how resilient that makes us to vectors like DDoS attacks. And like I said earlier, security is not just about one particular vector. We think about it as the full stack. We start with an approach where we trust nothing. We start right from the hardware infrastructure level, and we go all the way up to the device or the client accessing your data. At the infrastructure level, we have purpose-built hardware. That means two things. The first thing, we're stripping away parts that we don't use. That reduces the surface area of risk. And the second thing is we know the history of every single part in our hardware infrastructure. And that makes us that much more agile and nimble when we discover threats. We do this all the way up to the topmost layer. And all of you heard, of course, yesterday about the security keys and the fact that we've had zero incidents of account hijacking reported so far. Now, one of the things that's really important to remember, because I'm sure all of you are sitting here being like, it's 4 in the evening. Why is he giving us random trivia? This is not Jeopardy, is it? What does this mean for G Suite customers? It's that exact same network that brings to bear every single feature that you guys use in G Suite. Today, we serve more than 2 trillion files in Drive. And just as you're wrapping your head around that number, that growth rate of those files is growing really, really fast. Trust me. Our network is 1.7 times faster than a standard cloud network offering. And what this means is your teams, irrespective of where they're located in the world, can actually collaborate real time, I mean sub-second latency, and feel like they're actually co-located even though they're apart. Think about what that does for teaming. We catch 10 million spam messages every single minute. You know what that means? From the time I started talking to now, we just caught 50 million spam messages. And this is not something that we do at one particular data center, right? Remember, I said, we're truly planet scale. This is the network of G Suite data centers around the world doing all the hard work behind the scenes, either for you as admins or for you as end users of G Suite, just so that you can be superheroes at whatever you do in your day job. Now, let me switch gears a little bit. We've heard, as much as I've extolled all the benefits of our cloud scale infrastructure, for global scale infrastructure, we've heard from a few customers that they have this deep desire and the deep need to be able to control the location of their data at rest. We've listened to that need, and we're extremely committed to solving that problem for you. But we decided to dig a little bit deeper into that need. We didn't want to stop right there, right? And here are some of the things that we found. The first thing we found was that managing data location for customers is a very tough job today. Why is it tough? Well, it involves engineering effort. It involves scheduling. 
because you internally within your companies need to think about deployment waves. When you're moving data over from one location to another, you need to think through change management. You need to be able to do this in a way which is seamless. The transition looks smooth, et cetera. That's a lot of work. What that means is there's deployment delays, and you have very little visibility into when things are actually complete, because you're in full-fledged project management mode. And for your end users, this is actually very disruptive to their business. The day-to-day -day business is affected because files are going down when they're moving, right? They can't access it anymore. It goes into read-only mode, maybe. Just think about how tough that is for a knowledge worker whose day-to-day -day life is conveying thought in the form of email or documents. So we went back to the drawing board, and this was many months ago, and we asked ourselves the question, not the question of how can we check this box to be able to meet the need of customers and just locate data, right? That's not too tough. That's a trivial problem. Let's get data, put data, that's it. We asked ourselves, how can we design the best data region solution for our customers, all of you? What does that entail? What it entails is we put our engineering teams through immense amounts of thought and hard work, where we said, what if we gave customers the benefits of data regionalization along with the benefits of our planet-scale cloud infrastructure? Meaning to say, well, there are the laws of physics, which you can't really change in the networks, but what if we said, that we would still stick with the same levels of availability, the same levels of scalability, the same levels of performance to the extent possible, while you choose a region for your data. Let's build a solution that way so that the trade-off that you are making as customers is not a stark or a harsh one. With that, we're extremely proud to announce our general availability launch of data regions, which gives you the fine-grained control to be able to select a geographic location for your primary data of select G Suite apps. You can choose the US region, the Europe region, or continue to stick with our global preferences and help us bring the cloud scale infrastructure that we have to you. You can do this at an organizational unit level. Now, let's pause for a moment there and kind of go back to the earlier thought, right, where I said, we wanted to do this in a way in which the trade-offs were not stark or harsh. What did that mean for us? For us, it meant that we were doing it the right way. And for us, the right way is three key themes. We wanted to make, and we are making, data regions elastic, intuitive, and enterprise-ready. Now, over the next five minutes, Let's peel apart what it means for each of these key themes. Let's start with Elastic. We wanted to build a solution that uniquely adapts to your organization's needs, not the other way. And what that means is we make the ability of setting data regions policies extremely simple. Like you can see, all you have to do is click on an organization unit, click on a data region, and you're done. You're off to the races. That's it. There's actually no coding or any scripting involved anywhere. We've abstracted away all of the complexity of setting that region, moving data behind the scenes for you. You don't even need to worry about how many people in your company exist in that organizational unit. There's no minimum seat requirements. You can feel free to have at it. And we give you full flexibility. You can assign regions to as many OUs as you want, meaning to say the same domain can have multiple geolocation rules within it, just through a few simple clicks. Now, one of the other key things that we noticed that we heard from our customers is that existing data location solutions that they used felt very rigid. They were kind of one-time settings, 
the, you know, set the setting, data gets moved, and that's that. But that's not how business happens, right? Look, we get it. Things change in the business world. And in fact, in the 21st century, things change fast. There's US companies acquiring European ones. There's new divisions being spun up in different parts of the world. There's employees changing jobs between divisions. So we've built this in a fully scalable and fully flexible manner. You can change the data location of any of the OUs or any of your employees at any time and as many times as you want. Like I said, feel free to have at it. And all the data moves are completed within months. The second key theme is intuitive. A large part of this theme is keeping it simple and easy to understand. And that comes to bear on two different vectors. One, the admins vector, all of you here. The second, the end users vector. Let's start with the admin vector. Like I said earlier, you do not need to worry about deployment of data moves. You set the setting and let us do all the hard work behind the scenes of actually scheduling those moves at the opportune time that's not disruptive to your businesses. And what's more, it's actually peace of mind for you folks when you set the setting because the system continually adapts. It's dynamic. What do I mean by that? If you were to change a user's OU location from one place to another, and you were to change their OU from a US-based one to Europe, that's all you have to do. Our system automatically picks up that change and moves the files associated with that user over to the right OU or the right region. Even if you were to add new employees joining a company to an OU, our system figures that out and places all of their files at the right region. And what's more, if two end users were to change file ownership between each other, and think about that. That transaction actually doesn't involve you folks here as IT admins, a US-based end user changing file ownership to a Europe-based user. Our system takes care of that too. In other words, short of stopping, stopping short of using the word insurance, this is a lot of peace of mind. And that's how intuitive and easy this is. The second key theme around intuitiveness is that of the end users. At Google, we firmly believe that security and data controls don't need to come at the cost of the end user's experience. And one of the core principles by which we built our data region solution is that in your domain, if you have one user who has a data region policy against them versus another user who does not have a data region policy against them, guess what? their G Suite user experience is exactly the same, unless you send them an email telling them about that policy. There's something to be said for placebo effect there. What does this mean? Think about a data move. When a data move is happening, we do not lock out any file. Users can continue to operate on the file just as they normally would. Let's pause for a moment there. Anybody with knowledge of distributed systems knows that this is not a trivial problem to solve because the file is in transit. There could be multiple users located around the world making real-time edits to the file while it is in transit. Think about how non-trivial that is to solve. And for those of you that don't care too much about distributed systems. This is akin to fixing the engines of an aircraft while it is flying. We chose to go the extra mile and do all of the hard work to ensure that this data move is not disruptive to any of your end users. And therefore, you actually don't need to invest in change management at all and let us do the hard work of making data moves behind the scenes because all of this is entirely opaque to all of the employees in your company. The last and the key theme that we have is enterprise ready. 
we wanted to build a solution that scales to meet the needs of larger organizations. What does that mean? One of the key themes that we heard in all of the customer feedback that we received was the need for reporting data, reporting around move progresses. What our customers' admins told us is, my execs come by to me and ask me, are we there yet? And I don't have an answer. We actually provide up-to-date reporting in our dashboard. We aggregate all of the move progresses across our services, like you can see, by region. And we also aggregate it to one number at your domain level to answer the pesky, are we there yet, question. The second thing which is really important to note is this feature is included in G Suite Business and G Suite Enterprise at no additional cost, period. I see a lot of thumbs ups there. What does this mean? We incur a lot of network costs as you move files over. Remember, I said, feel free to have at it. It's fully flexible. You can move as many times as you want. Each time we incur those network costs, we're eating them up through the decades of investment that we've made in our network infrastructure to deliver true customer value in terms of TCO to all of you folks. So no additional charges included in G Suite Business and G Suite Enterprise from the get-go. And most importantly for you as IT admins, like I said, we want to make you look like superheroes in your own domains. You don't need to invest in setting up support desks. Can you imagine what would happen if docs went offline or if there was no edit access while moves were happening. Can you imagine the number of tickets that would be filed by all of your employees asking whether this was an outage? Is this an availability issue? And this really goes back to the extra mile we went to say, this should not be a trade-off between availability and a data control. So you actually don't need a support desk because they're not even going to know what are they going to complain about. Right? So those are the three key themes that we've kind of held ourselves to as we've invested in building out this feature. And what you have today is our first step towards that commitment. And as a first step towards that commitment in our general availability launch, we cover the primary data of these eight apps that you see up here. Gmail, Calendar, Drive, Docs, Sheets, Slides, Vault, and Hangouts Chat. And by primary data, I mean examples like the body of an email, the contents that you type into a document, and things like that. Now, we're keenly aware that there are other copies of data that we rarely use, like backups, for example, that aren't covered as a part of this launch. But like I said, we're extremely committed to meeting this need, and we're going to continue investing in building this solution out further. All right. With that, that's enough of me talking. They say seeing is believing. So what better way for all of you to experience the feature than through a demo? And to do that, I'd like to introduce all of you to Matthew Peter, my colleague and teammate, and the manager of trust programs at Google. Take it away, Matthew. All right. Uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, essentially a G Suite production domain. Uh, Outro Strat is our environment that we're using, and I've logged into the administrative console as an administrator. First, I'm going to go to the users section, uh, show you how we've set up our domain and organizational structure here. It'll make a little bit more sense uh, when we go to deploy data regions for this domain. So you see I've got engineering department, finance department, uh, in the finance department, you'll see I have my non-administrative account uh, for Matthew Peter. Uh, Ganesh is actually in our R&D uh, org unit here. Uh, so with that organizational structure configured the way it is, when I go to the company profile page and configure data regions, you'll see it makes a little bit more sense knowing the organizational structure and how we can set these things up as we go through. So as I go to the company profile underneath show more, I'll be able to select data regions. And when this page refreshes, you'll now see once again the organizational structure on the left-hand side, and you'll see the variable settings for data regions on the right. So with our primary domain of Altrostrat selected, we can see that the data regions... Sorry, help you out here. Oh, 
Thank you. Uh, the da doesn't, doesn't want to stay. That's right. good. Uh, the data region selection of no preference. Essentially what that means for the primary domain is it's going to continue to operate as it always has, using any of our Google-owned and operated data centers worldwide. But if I go down to my org unit and click on finance, you'll see that the selection automatically changes to the United States as I've pre-configured it. So all of my primary data for the applications that Ganesh mentioned earlier is going to be located in Google-owned and operated data centers in the United States. But with Ganesh's group, the R&D unit, he has a selection of Europe. So all of his primary data for those applicable products is going to be located in our European-based, Google-owned and operated data centers. So you don't, as he mentioned previously, have to have your entire domain in one region. You can pre-configure, or excuse me, you can configure individual org units or sub-OUs with any data location policy your organization needs. And if you have your entire domain in one region, you can just set it at the top level and inherit it all the way down. But you can also individually select organizational units and set the data location policy as you need to. Now, again, as Ganesh mentioned, it's very simple to make these settings and change your configurations. So if I decide we need to move our finance organizational unit to Europe, it simply is come in here, select the finance OU, select Europe, and hit save. It's that simple. A couple of clicks, hit save, and we on the Google side will begin moving all of the OU users in finance from United States data centers to European-based data centers. It will, again, be a seamless transition for your users, as Ganesh said. You, as a regular user, will not have any knowledge about which data center or which region your data is located in. You'll still have full read-write access during this uh, migration to a different region. You'll still be able to work collaboratively in real time in docs and sheets and slides. So it will be a seamless transition for your users. They won't even know that it's happening. For the changes that are made in the organization, uh, organizational structure with data location policies, we're also tracking all of those in the audit log. So you have a full audit trail of how your organization unit was configured, your data location policies, all the changes that you've made over time. As Ganesh said, if you're going to be flipping them back and forth every couple of days, you'll be able to see that in the audit log. Again, we've seen how to set our data location policies here, but we also wanted to provide a status update of how the migration is going. So if I go to the dashboard and the admin console, these are the info cards that Ganesh mentioned previously. And so this is going to give you a status update on how your migration is ongoing for data regions. So if we start on the right with the data regions move progress, it says Europe. Essentially what we're looking at there is for all of my organization's users that have a European-based data location policy, we're showing you the move progress there. So you can see Gmail's at 75%, but we've actually completed the move of all of the drives data for those users. Now one of the reasons you might uh, wonder why the difference is 75% for Gmail, calendars at 88, drives at 100. We do it, each product has a different um, setting because we're moving different amounts of data. We might be moving data for certain users who only have Gmail applicable or installed. They're only using Drive, things like that. So that's one reason you could have a discrepancy in the numbers on a product by product level. The other reasons are some of the reasons Ganesh mentioned earlier. Uh, individual users can actually affect data location policy by transferring file ownership. So if I have a whole bunch of drive files in my USA finance org that I own and I transfer them to Ganesh and his European-based org, all of those files are going to move from the USA-based data centers to the European-based data centers without admins having to do any work. Uh, the other way that the numbers could be different are if I get transferred from the finance org in the USA to work for R&D in Ganesh's org in Europe uh, without admins having to do anything with data location policy, simply by reassigning me to a new organizational unit, my data is going to transfer across the Atlantic. Uh, the middle info card there is pretty much exactly the same thing, but for US-based data location centers and our data location policies for your US users. And then on the far right-hand side, we wanted to provide a high-level summary for your entire organization. So you could just see one number giving you an overview for the entire migration, whether it's to Europe or to USA. Lastly, I've talked a lot about what's in the dashboards here and what's behind these numbers. 
So there's a learn more link there uh, with information in the help center, which will give information about the move progress, why the numbers are what they are, where they're coming from, um, and how we're populating that dashboard. So with that said, it's a very quick and simple demonstration of how to configure data regions and how to see the status of your moves uh, within your organization. Thank you, Matthew. That took, what, a few minutes mm -hmm. to actually set the settings and then view the progress? That was really quick. But everything that Matthew showed you so far was from the shoes of an admin in the admin panel. We spoke a lot about what the end user experience is like, right? And while Matthew was actually showing you this demo, I kicked off a document. Um, do you want to collaborate on the document, Matt? Yes. It's basically about our script at, uh, at, at Cloud Next. Yep. Um, I think we should really tell a knock-knock joke today. I forgot to tell one. So if you have one, we could do it. But you want to put one down? <laughs> no, I don't want to put one down. But you know, I never think it's too late for a knock-knock joke. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes aside, pause for a moment there and think through what happened. Like you saw at the beginning of the demo. I, a user in this AltoStrat domain, was located in Europe per the policies that Matt said. So as the owner of this document, the document resides in Europe. Matt and I were on two front ends, located here in Moscone West, San Francisco. Each time we made an edit, Behind the scenes, there was a transatlantic hop made where they reconciled all of the edits that we were making and came back to render the doc in the most accurate fashion possible. All of this happened in less than a few seconds with latency that was barely discernible to the human eye. This is what we mean by not making harsh trade-offs and delivering a beautiful and elegant end user experience despite data region controls being in place. Hopefully that gave you a flavor of everything that we've done in data regions. Uh, please give Matt a warm round of applause for the demo. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. I thought you did a great job of bringing the feature to life. Now. Let's move on to a different segment, right? At Google, when we build products, we build them with a lot of love. So you can kind of say that we're biased when we speak about our products. One of the key things that we do with every single product effort is engage closely with our key customers in a trusted tester program months before general availability. We do this to seek firsthand feedback to incorporate it in the product and make it better address the needs of customers. We've been in Trusted Tester behind the scenes for about six months now. One of our most valued customers in the Trusted Tester has been PwC. And a lot of the time and feedback that they've given us has helped bring the product to where it is at today. Now, while we have a quote up here, I thought, what better way to walk all of you through a journey that you probably are embarking on as you start using data regions than to absolutely hear it from the customer themselves? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to introduce Rob Tollerton, Director of IT from PwC. Come on up, Rob. Thanks, Ganesh. Great to join you here. Pleasure is all ours. Thank you so much for making time. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, if it's fine by you, can we spend the next 10 minutes in a fireside chat to really walk the audience through what PwC is all about, your G Suite journey, and how you envision using data regions? Absolutely. Fantastic. Let's get seated. Thank you. Fancy stools. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be careful to not fall off. <laughs> all right. Um, for the benefit of our audience, you want to tell us a little bit about PwC? Sure. So Ganesh, as you know, PwC is a large professional services firm. Uh, we deliver our services through member firms in 158 countries, and we have about 236,000 staff at the moment. So um, to deliver those uh, advisory, tax, and 
um, consulting services. We are relying on a lot of collaboration mm -hmm. amongst our users. And as a result, uh, I think in our last fiscal year, we offered services to 419 of the Fortune Global 500 and to another 100,000 businesses. Wow, that's really impressive scale. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your G Suite journey? Walk us through what that was like. Sure. So back in 2013, we uh, took a look at our collaboration platform and uh, made a decision. And we started our journey with Google in 2014. And obviously, we have been using G Suite services since then. I think for us, the use of G Suite services really helped us uh, to kind of change the business model that we were operating under. We were able to use a lot of real-time collaboration services, bring geographically dispersed teams together, and help really to deliver our services you know, in a more efficient way. And uh, focusing on servicing our clients is obviously top of mind. Absolutely. And I think when I think about it, to marry the, what you kind of spoke about second with the scale of PwC, mm -hmm. how do you manage it all in G Suite? So I, I think it was a big conversation when we were first coming on board. Uh, we had lots of conversations with engineers, probably more conversations with lawyers. And I, I think the reality was when we looked at the way our organization is constructed, uh, having the individual member firms go into the G Suite directory as separate organizational units allowed us to exert administrative access controls around the data objects that we're holding, obviously, in G Suite. Lots of email, lots of documents, and lots of files. Wow, that's a lot of OUs. Uh, hundreds. I won't tell you the number, but yes, many, many, that's many fair. hundreds. <laughs> So tell us, why is data regions important to PwC? So you know, Google Cloud really addresses a lot of our business needs uh, very well. However, we do have clients, and we also have uh, some regulatory requirements that are imposed on us that really cause us to have to look at how we can keep certain types of data in certain locales. So the introduction of Google's data regions really helps us to address some of those situations that we haven't been able to deal with up to this point in time. Absolutely. And you, of course, are intimately familiar with the feature. Thanks so much for partnering so closely with us in the Trusted Tester and for all the feedback. Mm -hmm. um, walk us through what that experience was like. So as you well know, we've been asking Google for this capability for many years. And uh, when you asked us to kind of participate in the discussions with your team and to kind of provide our feedback. Obviously, we jumped at that, that chance. And the way I looked at it was, you know, if we could leave the engineering complexity to Google and get our business needs addressed, you know, that was going to be a huge bonus for us. So uh, it, was, you know, it was really great having that opportunity to work with your team. And I think more importantly, um, to watch how the product, the, the capability, if you wish, evolved over its development, because obviously we participated through a number of phases, iterations of the release. And to see some of the uh, suggestions that we were making, uh, the team that was working on our side with your fellows and, 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 and folks, um, you know, to actually incorporate some of those suggestions. So you know, the, the dashboard and some of those info card changes, uh, it, it's great to see them reflected in the product that's available now. Thank you. That's great to hear. So now that we're generally available as a feature, how do you envision using it at PwC? So as I indicated, you know, we rely on the organizational unit construct um, pervasively throughout our domain. And uh, I think we were really pleased that you know, as we worked with you through the trusted tester, you had a similar mindset that that was a logical way to kind of group the, the data and, and control where it resided. So um, in our case, you know, we assign a user to a single OU. That means all their email, all their documents are sitting in one place. And um, when we look at what you've offered for us, it simply means now that we have the ability to 
make a decision as to where data needs to reside in a data region, have the administrators make the appropriate change request, and uh, press the, the go button. So, um, you know, you've, you've, you've stressed the simplicity of the tool, and certainly in the testing that we've done, uh, it's been extremely easy to work with. Uh, I, th I think, you know, being able to make that selection, let it then flow naturally without us having to worry about a lot of the administrative burden around tracking it, worrying about what kind of issues are going to crop up, um, you know, what was delightful. Um, and, and I say that because of we have a very demanding set of users, and um, they expect to be able to get at their documents, their email at all times. And you know, taking email offline is just a non-starter in our organization. So um, this kind of zero impact solution is really uh, valuable to us. That's very heartening to hear, and I'm sure some of our engineers would be really happy to hear that as well, because <laughs> they've gone the extra mile to invest that effort. Right. How important is reporting? So um, we obviously want to administratively track where the move is taking place. Uh, when we start deploying data regions in production, we'll be moving tens of millions of files. So you know, that's going to take many weeks, perhaps even months, to complete. And administratively, we want to know where we are. But I think more importantly for us, um, we get requests from lots of different places, regulatory authorities, um, our clients, who want confirmation as to where the data objects are being held. And having that dashboard present the status and, the in, and be very clearly indicating that the data has moved to the data region uh, is, is really important along with the, the audit trail and the logs. Absolutely, and, and I think we take that very seriously, uh, so seriously that we err on the side of accuracy instead of timeliness, just given the nature of data involved. So every time you make a setting change, we actually gray out the dashboard for 48 hours to ensure that it's you know, accurate. We, we chuckled about that because, of course, we were working with you and things were changing, and then it would blank out for two days, and we'd wonder when it would come back. But yes, we absolutely understand there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Right. Um, any, and to bring this all together, do you have any words of parting wisdom to our audience out here? <laughs> so you know, I think data regions um, is really going to um, help address a lot of use cases for some of the customers that you support uh, today. Um, I think it is obviously a first iteration. You know, as you stress, it only covers certain data objects or certain data types. And uh, we certainly are hoping that the journey continues because we definitely want to be able to uh, include other types of uh, data in the regions. So I, I think all of that um, you know, is positive. I think we definitely view it as a first step. And I think we also view it as part of a larger collection of data controls that we apply. So you know, at, at PwC, it's not just where the data is located. You know, it's who has access to it. So things like OAuth, application controls, DLP, you know, information rights management are all part of that suite of uh, controls that we, we deploy today. And quite frankly, uh, adding data regions is just going to expand that uh, collection of tools that we use on a ongoing basis. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I think you literally had the audience vicariously live your PwC experience of the trusted <laughs> tester as well as how you're going to use the feature. Thank you so much for making the time to come down here today. My and pleasure, guys. Actually, walk us through this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, one of the things that's really important to remember is that at Google, we're in the business of solving customer problems not just building features and shipping stuff, right? And why is this important? This is important because if you're a customer that cares about control over where your data resides, that hypothesis tends then to lend to the fact that when you lose control over that data, you no longer have control over where it resides, right? And there's three ways in which you could lose control over data in G Suite. Well-meaning users could share your data outside of the domain inadvertently. Content could go offline, get downloaded, for example, and then God knows where it's floating around. And third-party apps could gain access to your data 
through unwitting users granting them access. To bring all this together, I wanted to quickly walk you through three quick features that already exist in the admin panel today and have been live for a few months now that you could use along with data regions, much like what Rob spoke about, to really control where your data resides. You can set email settings for Gmail at an OU level to either surface a warning to users or to completely reject users from sending emails outside of your domain. You could leverage DLP to set rules for content which is sensitive. And you can do this across both Gmail and Drive. We actually bring to bear some of our machine learning smarts over here to lend to optical character recognition. So if there's a picture of a credit card, for example, instead of a credit card number itself, that's something that we will catch as well in our DLP. We, you can also set settings around content, which is in Drive, for both team drives and individual drives. And this, these are settings that are available not just to admins, but also to end users to prevent files from being copied, downloaded, printed out, traditional information rights management, as you will. And lastly, we give you very granular visibility into all the third-party app accesses that are happening currently in your domain. And it's not just visibility. We also give you the ability to whitelist specific apps that you trust, and users can grant access to just those apps. This ensures that all of your data stays in G Suite and stays in the region that you want it to stay in. So ladies and gentlemen, if there's three things I want you to take away from this 45-minute session, it is that we are building data regions for G Suite in an elastic, intuitive, and enterprise-ready way. With that, we're at the hour mark. I'd love to take questions offline, because I think they, they need the stage for the next presentation. But I do want to say thank you so much. You've all been a really kind audience. Hopefully, you're all just as excited as we are. Data regions for G Suite, generally available to all G Suite business customers and G Suite enterprise customers. Thank you. Thank you.